This is Twit. Google, Oracle, 11 years in the making. I have to say I did not see this one coming, Denise. No, I didn't see it coming either. Uh, and, and yes, 11 years is a long time, but I just want to put it in perspective. 11 years to go up and down the appellate system the way this one did is really not that long a period of time in our U.S. judicial system. I looked this up for you, Leo, uh, because you were talking about how long running the case was. Uh, apparently, there was a case in the United States that holds the dubious distinction of being the longest, What's the longest? courtroom battle. Um, it involved uh, an estate, and it went on for 57 oh, years. Geez. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that's, that's like a lifetime. The plaintiff, oh, wow. it's maybe several lifetimes. Myra Clark Gaines was her name. And of course, there's Dickens Bleak House, which revolves around Jarndyce versus Jarndyce famously. And oh, yeah, I yeah, find, yeah. Find exactly how long that famously. It's still going know, 150 years later. Yes, exactly. Well, um, Microsoft so, DOJ went on from 98. Well, that might have been not quite 20 years. It went on for quite a while. So I guess right. it isn't unheard of. What's really uh, feels unusual is is the way this went because Google would win, then Google would lose, then Google would win, then Google would lose. The the appellate court would throw it back to the lower court, would throw it back to the appellate court. This thing was ping ponged back and right. forth. Yeah, there were a lot of so there were a lot of issues here that required a jury to help work them out when you have a fair use argument like the one that Google ultimately prevailed on. There are a lot of facts that a jury has to determine, but then it's ultimately up to the court and the judicial system once they have all those factual determinations to decide if fair use happened. Um, so there's that complicating factor we needed. It, it couldn't just happen in the absence of a jury. So um, some of these issues were jury issues that go back to the trial that started uh, almost 11 years ago now. Uh, it, actually, the <laughs> the trial started almost instantly after Oracle bought Sun. Mm -hmm. And Sun had invented Java, uh, which was a write once, run anywhere programming language. It's still probably to this day with the most popular programming language in the world. Certainly, it's right up there. Um, I remember interviewing Jonathan Schwartz, who was the CEO of Sun at the time, and he couldn't say this at the time, but during the interview, which was on triangulation, he said, you know, I knew something was up because when we started meeting with Oracle about all the assets and I started talking about Java, I could see the lawyers in the room lighting up. Oracle immediately recognized what this meant. In fact, at one point, uh, the courts had told Google, you owe Oracle $9 billion for infringing on their Java API. So this this goes way back to, to the purchase of Sun. Might even have been the motivating reason Oracle purchased Sun. But remember, you, you have to go back even before that because that was the start of the legal case. The start of the saga actually happened, I think, in 2003 when Google... Schmidt approached Sun and said, we want to license Java SE. We want to and use it for Android, right? They wanted to use it for Android, but they had a stipulation. They said, look, we want to open source this. And Sun didn't want to do that because they felt that they were just going to fork it and then they would lose their licensing fee. So Google decided to call off the deal and instead they made a clean room version of Java. So th the entire case hinges off was that actually a clean room? No, it doesn't. And, and, yeah. Well, it did in the early days. But it was it did, yeah. <laughs> eventually, now correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Denise Howell, because you know law, this is complicated. But eventually that did not was not the issue. The issue was whether a clean room version of Java was somehow protected, whether the APIs that Google duplicated, they didn't use Oracle code, they didn't use Sun's code, they just duplicated the APIs because otherwise a program expecting Java wouldn't be able to use right. whatever Dalvik or whatever Google ended up writing. And then, so at one point, it, a jury, I think, ruled that APIs were copyrightable. Right. That and, and was the turning point. Yes, it was. And you're right. There's no question that copying happened here. 
And the right. the opinion itself, I, I recommend Justice Breyer's opinion. It's 62 pages long Holy as God. I have it open on. Did he seem to really understand it? Okay, so this is really interesting, I think. The very okay. beginning of the opinion uh, starts out with, and let me find the exact language here because you'll love it. Um... One second. I'll just I'll just mention a couple of uh, while you're looking that up turning points yeah. in this. Uh, Judge Alsup, who was uh, who was uh, covering this case in the Northern District of California, the first jury trial, Oracle v. Google, very famously in 2012 learned Java, so, <laughs> learned Java so that he could see if it was because the issue at this point was what was copied and 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 oracle it came down to one routine the range check routine that that oracle felt google literally copied the judge learned java and wrote his own range check routine just to see if if that was a copy or just the logical likely way to write such a thing the judge said, I couldn't have told you the first thing about Java before this trial, but I have done and still do a lot of programming myself in other languages. I've written blocks of code like range check a hundred times or more. I could do it. You could do it. It's so simple. <laughs> he wrote it in Java and uh, the judge who learned Java. Um, Th there, was a, there was a line from his decision that said, yes. so long as the specific code used to implement a method is different, anyone is free under the Copyright Act to write his or her own code to carry yes. out the exact same function. Of course. As long, it does not matter that the declaration or method header is identical. That, that was his final verdict. Yeah, but that all went out the window. <laughs> yeah. Because it ended hey. up being, all right, all right, you didn't steal the code. <laughs> but, but. We have you copied co the code. You though. Copied Nobody's the ever oh, they disputed, never disputed that they that. copied. Okay. Yeah. They got away 37, with it. So they, 37 examples, which included documentation. So there were comments that okay, were brought so they over. They clearly copied it. But that wasn't yeah. what they were suing over in the long run, right? I, uh, it's well, so, so confusing. The jury found that it was a fair use, and ultimately that's the determination that the Supreme Court got behind, got behind in a big way. So and, and this was the, what, this was very important because if you could say, oh, no, I own an API, no one can copy it, it would break the, the world as Correct. we know it. You couldn't write and, code anymore. Right. And actually, I should correct myself because I just contradicted what I said earlier. Juries find facts that go to the fair use determination. It was Judge Alsop, the <laughs> wonderful um, guy who threw himself so headlong into this so that he could understand it so thoroughly. Uh, that made that initial fair use determination. And, so he and said, it's okay, that's fair use. That's fair use. And, and that's ruled what, in Google's favor. Yes. But then and, and Oracle appeals. Had, mm -hmm. And, uh, and wins. There's, there's a whole question. The, the issue that you hit on earlier, and it's still, um, it was still very much an issue when it got to the Supreme Court, the copyrightability of an API uh, was something that... Uh, the federal circuit, which was the court of appeal here, found yes, APIs can be copyrightable. The Supreme Court has has uh, punted on that. They've decided that since the fair use argument is established, it doesn't matter whether APIs are copyrightable or not. Ah. They just assumed, for purposes of writing their decision, that they were. And decided we don't we don't have to decide that critical issue. There's a lot. This is a changing area of the law. There's this is technology is changing all the time. This may be something that we want to re-examine at some point or another. Um, they did reverse that part of the federal circuit's decision and decided we're we're not going to say whether it's copyrightable or not. That was at this point. Was that wise to dodge that? Probably. Uh, um, well, Justice Thomas didn't think so. He dissented. Uh, but I, personally, I think it probably was wise. <laughs> I think that there, there's a lot to unpack in the squishy nature, as far as the law is concerned, of an API. It, it so they very much it. straddles this boundary between copyright and patent. And, so they said and, it might be copyrightable and might not be, but we're going to rule that it's fair use, so it doesn't matter. 
That's right. So even if we say that it's copyrightable, which we're not saying, <laughs> even if it were copyrightable, right. it's fair use and that's all that matters. But what I was going to say, yeah, you just, know, Justice Breyer's uh, opinion. Yes. Yes. Praises to Judge Alsa for, for his understanding of the critical issues at hand. <laughs> the court here, you know, you can, you can scratch your head about whether the actual justices of the Supreme Court have a thoroughgoing understanding of API calls or not. But if you read the first part of this decision, there, you know, it gives you faith in our court system and particularly the vehicle of the Supreme Court to really thoroughly understand issues whether the justices do or not, the clerks do, they get a lot of friends of the court briefs and they can write an opinion. You know, I, I really would love to hear from some of our programmer listeners if they read through the first part of this opinion, which is prefaced by, through an API, a programmer can draw upon a vast library of pre-written code to carry out complex tasks. For laypersons, including judges, juries, and many others, <laughs> some elaboration of this description may prove useful. <laughs> and then it launches into pages of detail about the facts of this case. And, and as I, you know, I'm not a programmer, I'm a lawyer, but I read through this and it rings really accurately to me. <laughs> so I'd be um, interested in how our, our geekier listeners re react to it as well. I think the court, you know, in my humble opinion, did a good job here of trying to grasp the actual actual issues at hand. And the dissent from uh, Justices Alito and uh, Thomas really was over this copyright thing. They felt the court should have ruled on whether uh, you could copyright an API. Yes. I think, I think Breyer's opinion was this is as you said, in flux, we should we should uh, defer this as long as we can because this is a complicated thing and and things are changing. We can rule on this part of it and dispose of this matter without having making any assumption about copyright. Should it really be the le the uh, a legislative thing? Should it be Congress that desert, decides? You think on the very much so. I mean, that's where this this confusion exists in the difference. You know, the actual descriptions of what's patentable and what's copyrightable that come up to us from the legislature. Right. So if we're in a gray area here, I think the court wisely decided, you know, it's not for us to make that call. And perhaps the legislature will want to do so, recognizing that we're in a gray area. Yeah. I, so I agree Denise, with you that, that Breyer's this... description of an API is actually pretty, ad, pretty adept. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he understood the issues uh, involved with... with making an API unusable. Fair use is probably a good way to handle this until Congress does. Go ahead, Father Robert. Is this legal can kicking? I mean, since well, they haven't really question. decided yeah. that, it's gonna come up again. At some point, someone's gonna try to they, make a play for saying, you can't use my API without paying me. Well, the, I think the fair use determination heads that off, right? I mean, if, if somebody does what Google did here, again, they used a small part, less than 1%, I think, of the overall uh, code that was at issue. Uh, so they, you know, you go through the fair use factors. Did, did you use, you know, the least amount that you could? And is it transformative? And, and really what this opinion gets to is, you know, what are the goals of the Copyright La Act and what, you know, how are they supposed to serve innovation going forward? Are we consistent with that go with those goals in this decision? And th the court lays out how they feel that you know, it, much like um, there's copying involved in the existence of a search engine, but we all need search engines, and right. they serve a very practical and useful and innovative purpose for us. Uh, even though none of those search engine precedents were cited in this decision. It, it's a similar kind of reasoning where you need to look at all the factors and decide whether uh, fair use is necessary here to make, you know, the cogs of the machine turn. And, and I think that's, although the court didn't put it that way, and I'm putting it less elegantly than the court put, uh, I feel like it's, it's a, there was a practical basis to this opinion. So what is, so in, at least in the, in the usage uh, that I understand of fair use, um, there are some tests for fair use. Ultimately, it's up to a court to decide. It's a defense, not, it's not a proactive thing. It's only a defense if somebody sues you. But 
Right. But there are some tests that are commonly used. Do those also apply to this? What did the, did the justices talk about how this, why this is fair use? Yeah, very much so. And and what what did they, what did they say? What, um, it, how, the, how, why the is amount this fair of use? copying was a tiny bit compared yeah. to uh, the actual work? They looked at um, the nature of the work. Is this is not like copying music or art or you know this is uh, copying as a means to an end, a very practical, functional end, um, and various other factors that went into the analysis. Yeah, the, the, because fair use is a legal issue, the court here got to look at, you know, it didn't have to it defer. It defines it, it defines Yes, it didn't have to defer yeah. to what had been done below and could go through and decide why it felt that the factors applied. Was, wasn't one of the factors, I read through this very briefly, but like, wasn't one of the factors like essentially the financial gain or profit of it? Like if you're using it for money making, I guess, cause like Android is, is open source. They kind of sidestep that. Well, Google, uh, yes. Google as I mean, Oracle was quick to point out, made a lot of money on Android. Right. <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. where the nine billion came from. Right, uh, but but yes, it 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 it, it was um, you know there are a whole host of factors that go into deciding whether something is fair use. And uh, certainly whether it's commercial or non-commercial is one of them. But again, they all sort of weigh against each other. And uh, what the court seemed to be most concerned with here is uh, there was a lot of discussion of the investment of time and resources and brain power of the people working with the APIs. And, and were, you know, was that all gonna go for nothing? Um, shouldn't, shouldn't that be something that's meaningful? And uh, <laughs> I, the court certainly felt that it should. Did did the court consider damage to Oracle? Did they consider the you know Google made a lot of money off Oracle's back? Was that? I mean, I'm sure that's how Oracle feels about it. I I'm sure it is. No, it, this this seemed to be more focused on the actual fair use analysis, and uh, given that there was no recoverable harm because fair use applied. Right you wouldn't get into the damages phase of anything. This was, it's kind of, the history of this case is hysterical because this is not the first time the, the Supreme Court has seen it. Um, it. It went up to the Supreme Court uh, over this fair use thing and they sent it back to the lower court saying, no, no, you have to decide this. Right. The, the lower court decided it was not fair use, that Oracle had won, at which point Google appeals once again to the Supreme Court. Now, this time, the, the Supreme Court can't send it back to the lower court because the lower court did, in fact, rule that it was not fair use, so they had to take this on. Um, and it, and this is why I was concerned. I felt like this is not looking good uh, for Google. I wasn't rooting for Google because they're Google or against Oracle because they're Oracle, although that's tempting. But I really felt like any determination that you could, you could close off APIs would be really damaging Mm -hmm. uh, as the justices, by the way, or as Breyer pointed out, that 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 the whole industry relies on this kind of free sharing of information. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And and that's why I keep thinking, you know, again, it's it's a totally different body of law. But the courts that had to wrestle with copyright when it came to search engines had sort of similar conundrums in front of them. Yes, there's copying happen here, happening here. And there it was copying of, you know, things that were arguably creative, all the things that go into your search results, the art, the writing, everything else that you can search for on the internet. And that stuff is being copied so that you can find them. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet the courts that considered whether search engines should exist found yeah, they should. And I feel like that's what's, uh, there's there's some of that kind of pragmatic approach going on here. People will be reading this opinion for a long time, and I imagine it'll be taught in law schools. It's, it's re I mean, just in my, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but just in my reading of it, I found it fascinating. Uh, and I thought oh, the absolutely. reasoning was very intriguing. He, uh, Breyer does take on uh, Thomas's dissent. And, say, and explains why he feels like uh, you know we didn't we we shouldn't necessarily rule on this uh, copyright issue. Um, it's really it's I think it's historic. Uh, 